The name Chernobyl is now synonymous with nuclear radiation. It is cemented into our social consciousness and exemplifies why a safety culture surrounding atomic power is essential. The 1986 meltdown at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant released 400 times more radioactive material than the Hiroshima atomic bomb. But what caused this disaster? In this video, we will take a detailed look at the events that led to the worst nuclear disaster in history. During the 1970s, Russia was still the leader of the communist USSR, although tensions had eased slightly between Moscow and the US. Russia had been using nuclear energy for over 10 years, building the world's first atomic power plant that produced electricity in 1954. In 1970, construction began on a new nuclear plant, the Chernobyl Power Complex in Ukraine. The plant was just over 80 miles from Kiev and roughly 12 miles from Chernobyl. The operation was massive, and a new town called Pripyat, after the nearby river, was built to house the workers and their families. In addition to the plant in the city, an artificial lake was constructed to cool the reactors. The reservoir was placed next to the river Pripyat, a tributary to the Dnieper. It was a time of hope, and the new city was considered a utopia for those who moved there. One former resident, Natasha Kondratiev, recalls, From the first day we came to Pripyat, I never wanted to leave. It was a paradise. Everywhere there were roses and fruit trees. We could fish in the river and pick mushrooms in the forest. It seemed the place had been created especially for us. At its peak, Pripyat housed 49,000 inhabitants, comprised of plant workers and their families. Unit 1 of the new power plant was constructed in 1970, followed by Unit 2 in 1977, and Units 3 and 4 in 1983. By 1986, two more reactors were under construction. The reactors were known as RBMK reactors and were unique in that they used light water as a coolant and graphite as a moderator. While graphite is non-flammable, it is combustible, and years later, experts would determine that the very design of these reactors was the underlying cause of the disaster. On April 25, 1986, the Unit 4 reactor was scheduled to be shut down for maintenance which was seen as an opportunity to test the plant's backup systems. It was decided to run an experiment to determine whether, in the event of a power loss, the slowing turbine would produce enough power to operate the water pumps that cooled the core along with the emergency equipment until the diesel emergency power supply came online. This test had been run once before in similar circumstances, but it had proved inconclusive, and so a second test was authorized. At around 2 p.m., the team disabled the emergency core cooling system of Unit 4's reactor to stop interfering with the test. However, shutting down the reactor at that time was deemed to have too much impact on the region's power needs, so the shutdown and subsequently the test was delayed. It was 11 p.m. when the grid controller allowed further power reduction, and by this time the less experienced workers on the night shift had relieved the day shift. It was later alleged that these workers had not received proper instructions on how to perform the test. By 12.28 a.m. on April 26, things started to go wrong. The reactor's power fell to 30 megawatts when operators should have stabilized it at 1,000 megawatts before beginning the shutdown. To try and increase the power, the operating team decided to remove some of the control rods, so they switched off the automatic regulators in order to manually remove the rods which violated the plant's safety guidelines. At about 1 a.m., the reactor was stabilized to around 200 megawatts. Although the reactor's power was way below where it should have been, and the fact that there were less than half the amount of control rods in place to retain reactor control, the plant supervisors authorized operators to continue with the test. To carry out the process, other safety features, including the automatic emergency shutdown system, were disabled. Operators had to try and control the reactor manually and remove more rods in an attempt to maintain the power. At around 1.23 a.m., the test began, and the core became increasingly unstable almost immediately. Despite their best efforts, the operators could not stop it when a sudden rise in power, thought to have been 100 times the usual power output, surged through the core. They immediately pressed the emergency shutdown button, but the control rods jammed as they entered the core. Unfortunately, the control rods were tipped with graphite, which combusted when they entered the core. Seconds later, a steam explosion destroyed the reactor's core, 
quickly followed by another explosion. The explosions catapulted the reactor's 1,000-ton roof off, and a fireball shot into the sky. One of the engineers, Valery Kodumchuk, had been sent to the Corps to monitor the test results. The explosion killed him instantly, and his fellow engineer, Vladimir Sheshenuk, died while attempting to rescue his friend. From this point on, dangerous amounts of radiation began to spew out of the reactor as a blackout plunged the plant into darkness. Graphite dust and chunks filled the air, and fires started across the plant, including on the top of Unit 3. The fires provoked the response of the emergency firefighters, and by 1.28 a.m., the first team of 14 men arrived at the scene. They had no idea of the danger they were in, and were not wearing any protective gear that would shield them from the radiation. More were called in to deal with the spreading fires, and by 2.10 a.m., the largest fires on the machine hall roof had been extinguished, and at 2.15 a.m., Soviet officials had been alerted to the catastrophe and called an emergency meeting in which they decided to stop cars from entering or leaving Pripyat. However, the police officers assigned to the roadblocks were also unaware of the radiation leak and did not wear any protective clothing. By 2.30 a.m., the team had controlled the largest fires on the roof of the reactor hall. By 4 a.m., over 100 firefighters were on the scene many of whom unknowingly added to their already dangerous dose of radiation by staying on call at the site. By 5 a.m., most of the fires were out, but the graphite blocks had now been exposed to high temperatures, making them combust. The intense graphite fire began dispersing fission fragments and radionuclides high into the atmosphere, and officials shut down Reactor 3, followed later by Reactors 1 and 2. To make matters worse, there was very little knowledge of how to fight a graphite fire, and the emergency service workers feared that an attempt to extinguish it might make it worse. At 6.35 a.m., most of the fires were out, except for the one still burning in the reactor core, and it was decided that layers of material would have to be dumped on the reactor to combat the fire and subsequent radioactive release. At 10 a.m. on April 27th, helicopters flew over the site, spreading quantities of lead, sand, clay, dolomite, sodium phosphate, and polymer liquids onto the reactor. By this time, it was acknowledged that radiation poisoning was a serious threat, and helicopter pilots who hovered over the area were known to have received high doses of radiation, so it was decided that the materials should be released. In contrast, the helicopters flew over the reactor. However, this caused more damage to the surrounding structures, further spreading the contamination. At 2 p.m. on April 27th, Soviet authorities finally started to evacuate people from Pripyat and the surrounding area. They were told that this was merely a temporary evacuation and that they only needed to take their papers, vital belongings, and food. However, later it would be revealed that Pripyat was too radioactively dangerous for human habitation and would be for around 24,000 years. For many, this was the first indication that their life next to a nuclear power plant was unsafe. One former resident recalled, People lived with the power plant. They worked there. They relied on it. We didn't even think of radiation. On April 28th, the rest of the world discovered the disaster after Swedish air monitors detected a large amount of radiation in the atmosphere that they traced back to the USSR. When pushed for comment, Soviet officials claimed that there was an accident, but it was under control. However, the graphite fire would continue to burn until May 10th. In the meantime, despite the risks, the authorities refused to cancel the May Day festivities in Kiev. The cleanup operation continued, and on May 4th, around 800,000 workers began bulldozing contaminated villages and shooting contaminated animals, both wild and domestic. They also buried large amounts of radioactive topsoil. By May 6th, authorities finally started safety measures, closing schools in Kiev and advising residents to stay indoors and not eat leafy vegetables. On May 8th, workers finally finished draining 20,000 tons of radioactive water from the basement of the core. And on May 9th, they poured concrete under the reactor before encasing the whole thing in concrete and metal. By the time the radiation had been contained, around 57,915 square miles had already been contaminated. The affected area reached over 300 miles north of the plant, and included parts of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia. On May 14, 1986, Mikhail Gorbachev publicly spoke about the incident. While trying to defend his government's botched handling of the situation, 
He said, The accident at Chernobyl showed again what an abyss will open if nuclear war befalls mankind. For inherent in the nuclear arsenal stockpile are thousands upon thousands of disasters far more horrible than the Chernobyl one. While many dismissed his sentiments as trying to divert attention from the disaster, seeing a Russian leader promote anti-nuclear opinions was astonishing. However, this realization came with a high price for the people directly involved in the Chernobyl catastrophe. By the end of July, 28 of the people who were present at the plant during the disaster were dead from radiation poisoning. The official death toll contributed to Chernobyl is just 31, although the UN says it could be more than 50. Although death and disability rates continue to rise amongst those who were part of the cleanup team, health studies claim that there is no direct correlation between their radiation exposure and an increase in other forms of cancer or disease. However, for those who have lost loved ones, there will always be that element of doubt. Natasha Kondratiev lost her daughter at the age of 19 when she collapsed from an asthmatic fit six years after her family had been evacuated from Pripyat. Natasha will always wonder if the disaster caused her daughter's fate. Who knows if Chernobyl caused her asthma? All we know is that before the accident, she was healthy. She was exposed to radiation when she was 12, which is a critical age for a child's development. It was probably linked to Chernobyl, but nobody can say for sure. What is known is that there have been at least 1,800 documented cases of thyroid cancer in children who were between 0 and 14 when the disaster occurred. This number is far higher than normal, although the cancer can be successfully treated with surgical and medical options. In the autumn of 1986, the people of Pripyat were told that a city would be built just for them. By 1988, the city of Slevutic was complete and the ex-workers of the Chernobyl site were allowed their pick of the houses and apartments. Today, one in three residents of Slevutich formerly lived in Pripyat. They maintain that the world might have suffered an even bigger catastrophe if it weren't for the men who risked their lives containing the disaster. For them, Pripyat represents destruction, defeat, a lost city, a dead city. Slevutich is the resurrection. Many still mourn their former lives in Pripyat and thousands are still employed by the Chernobyl power plant, undergoing daily radiation checks on their 50-minute return journey home at the end of the day. The site now has largely returned to nature, although plant and animal mutations have been reported in the area. Despite the lingering radiation, the Chernobyl area is now open to visitors. However, this is still somewhat restricted, and a few residents return to their homes as the radiation is now at a level that is not considered fatal. Incredibly, Rare species, including beavers, moose, wolves, wild boar, and birds, are now thriving in the area regardless of the increased radiation levels. How would you like to get a deeper understanding of history, impress your friends, and predict the future more accurately based on past events? If this sounds like something you might be into, then check out the brand new Captivating History Book Club by clicking the first link in the description. To learn more about history, check out our Captivating History book series. It's available as ebooks, paperbacks, and audiobooks. If you found the video captivating, please hit the like button and subscribe for more videos like this.